What's going on guys? Welcome back to another episode of SBS and today is going to be kind of a special episode. We are going to try and diagnose an issue with the Cork Sport turbos and I'm talking about the very first revision so that means it has the smaller wastegate port, smaller wastegate flapper and the thing used to boost spike all the hell. Uh, I bought mine used so thankfully I didn't have to pay full price for it. I bought it for around $930 shipped from a guy in Quebec. Uh, it looks like the bearings might be shot because there's oil in the compressor housing, there's oil in the turbine housing and buddy that I bought it from said it was in perfect working order so he f***ing lied to me. Great. But I know that these turbos were very prone to boost creep uh, so we're going to try and fix that. Uh, I've done some rough measurements already but we're going to go over that in this video with Vernier and show you what's going on on the turbine side and why these things boost creep. So keep it here. So if you are new to the channel, my name is Sean, and this is SPS, stands for Sean Breaks <laughs> except I can't use that full name because, you know, YouTube doesn't like curse words. But if you are new to this channel and you own a Mazda Speed 3 or a Mazda Speed 6 and you are looking towards getting a Cork Sport Turbo as an upgraded turbo instead of a BNR S3 or a BNR S4 or a GTX 30 whatever, <laughs> then we are going to go over the issues that happened with the first generation of the Cork Sport turbos. Um, they have since been revised, uh, but apparently you still get a little bit of boost creep. Not nearly as bad as with these housings on the turbine side, but you still do get a little bit of boost creep, um, as far as what I've been reading, anyways, on the Mazda Speed forum. If you do have a Mazda Speed platform, whether it be a Speed 6 or Speed 3, uh, I, I think you should subscribe to my channel because that's mainly what I'm working on because I can't afford anything nice. And if you haven't done so already, consider liking this video if you like the content. I realize this is the beginning of the video, but if by the end you're like, oh, that was pretty good, hit the like button. Just do it. Do it. Do it. Just do it. So now that I have the greetings and salutations out of the way, let's get down to tearing this thing apart and seeing what some of the issues are with the first revision of the Cork Sport Turbo, which is now called the CST4. So if you're like me, you like to save a little bit of money wherever you can uh, by purchasing used car parts, basically. Uh, my Mazda Speed 3, I'm basically trying to aim to have the entire thing built from used parts aside from the high pressure fuel pump internal kit. That's the only thing that I bought brand new and motor mounts. Oh, nope, that doesn't count. They're, they're not power adders. But as far as everything else, intake, intercooler, front mount, okay, so, okay, no, the piping kit I bought new too. Everything else uh, I've basically bought used either off of the Facebook Marketplace or off of Kijiji. So this was what I thought was a Kijiji score of the century. Uh, $930, but it's not working right. The oil seals have definitely blown. Let's get into tearing this thing down. So for those of you not too familiar with the Cork Sport Turbo or the CST4, which is what it's now known as, it is based on a TD05H18G center section. So that would be the journal bearing that's in the center, that whole piece. Everything else about it is basically custom, except the turbine wheel seems eerily uh, similar in size to a regular 18G turbine wheel and shaft. The only thing that's different is the compressor wheel itself. It uses a extended tip technology wheel that's very similar to a Bohr Warner wheel, um, but it looks like it was a wheel that was custom manufactured for this compressor housing. This compressor housing I'm not exactly sure if it's just a standard Mitsubishi or MHI compressor housing, but they fit this wheel inside it, so that's that's cool. And yeah, it's there. That's oil. So now we're going to take off the fitting for the coolant line as well as the uh, tube for the oil drain.
was putting the uh, bolts back in for the oil drain just so I don't lose them. Now, we've already disconnected the wastegate flapper arm here, but because I want to take off the compressor housing and the turbine housing, I need to basically take off everything. start with taking off the turbine housing and before we do that we're just gonna mark so that uh, we know where our turbine housing was lining up with the compressor housing and this little stamp just uh, basically lets me know where to line it back up with nothing that's gonna cause any cracking or anything on the turbine housing from the heat because it's not that deep it's just a tiny little score uh, so now we know exactly where the turbine housing has to line up with when we uh, go to put it back together. So now let's take it off. And just so you don't lose anything, I'm putting the uh, bolt and nut back together with the retainer. Now, you'll have to use some force to get your turbine housing off, just because it's had a lot of heat going to it. Yes, yeah, so the oil seals on the CHRA are uh, totally blown. You can very easily see just how soaked this turbine wheel is with oil all over the uh, shroud. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Oh, look at that. Okay, so there's a locking pin on the turbine housing. I wasn't aware of that. So for, uh, for lining it back up, it actually should be fairly straightforward. When you put it back down, it'll only assemble one way. So this is not a clockable turbo. Good to know. So now that we have this taken apart, we can see our wastegate flapper. It's, uh, it's exceptionally tiny. So this port on the white paper that Cork Sport actually provides you is 24 millimeters. So you, you don't have a lot of room to try and uh, actually poured out this hole because I'll, I'll show you when I zoom in more but when this flapper arm goes down the edge of it is basically resting right on that inner lip of the port hole itself so you have to be very careful if you're gonna try and port this uh, without actually paying for the new revised housing from Cork Sport, which actually uses a 34 millimeter flapper valve, which is actually just the standard TD05H upgraded flapper arm, which is the same for the Mitsubishi Evo 1 through 3 turbos, um, except the, the Mitsubishi Evo 1 through 3 um, flapper arms has a different design. design, it's actually backwards. So instead of coming out like that, it actually goes like this. Uh, but yeah, you can get you can get those upgraded flapper arms for around 75 um, bucks Canadian shipped and the upgraded cork sport or the revised cork sport turbine housing has a 27 millimeter port hole which to me still seems really small I I don't know why they would go with 27 millimeter port unless it's just because BNR is using a 27 millimeter port as well but they also get boost creep um, rather substantially. I think I hear a BRZ coming. Oh, Mitchell. Did 
Did you literally come by just for that? Absolutely. <laughs> and, and now he's off again. always seems to uh, show up at the just perfect time so but <laughs> now that Mitch the entertainer is gone uh, back to the turbo housing now I, I actually kind of forget what the hell I was saying uh, but if you see inside the wastegate port you can see that lip down past here on the inside that casting mark that's about the only thing that you can uh, that you can port because if you look at the flapper itself, yeah, so just as the white paper said, it is basically a 28 millimeter flapper. There is a lot of room where they could have used a larger flapper. Like look at all of the room around there. I honestly, I don't know why Cork Sport or BNR would have used a 28 millimeter flapper. It, for a high horsepower or higher horsepower um, capable turbo like this, it, it makes honestly no sense. Uh, 32 millimeter should have been like minimum. You can just barely see the room where it's clean on the, the face of that port. That's uh, how much room you have to work with when this flapper is down. It's not a lot, so you technically could port this out, but you you can't port it to anywhere near what the revision is. So um, my only option is to really either try and port this to as large as I can. I'm either gonna have to get a one of the new revised turbine housings, but that's another $200 US uh, out of my pocket that I don't really wanna spend, to be honest. Uh, I already spent almost a grand on this turbo itself, thinking that it was in good working order. That's on me for trying to use a Kijiji deal. Um, but I do have one alternative solution that I could try, and that is to basically buy the upgraded 34 millimeter flapper. The uh, manufacturer is Mamba. Uh, they're based out of Taiwan, but it's just a stainless steel flapper arm. It doesn't really matter. The whole arm I wouldn't need, just the actual flapper itself. And what I would have to do is basically drill out this rivet so that I could put on my own flapper itself keep this wheel because an upgraded flapper should technically fit because that's exactly what cork sport does anyways so that's one thing kind of diagnosed I realize cork sport themselves have already diagnosed this and for the most part they have already solved the issue uh, with their newest revision um, again for the most part the higher the boost level that you run the less boost creep you'll actually have because you're already reaching the, reaching the upper limits of the turbo anyways. So if you're running 22 to 23 PSI on a Cork Sport Turbo, the first revision, you generally don't see as bad of a boost creep. So now that we have that diagnosed, sort of, we're gonna move on to the center section and tearing that apart. And you will find that as we get into the center section, it's actually just a standard MHI Mitsubishi bearing kit that is used in these turbos. So it is fully rebuildable, fully serviceable, and a bearing kit for this turbo is about $150. Now, these turbos are triple balanced, as Cork Sport actually tells you in their white paper and on all of their sales sheets on their website, that these turbos are triple balanced from the factory. Every Mitsubishi, uh, Mitsubishi turbo is. Uh, they balance the compressor wheel, they balance the turbine wheel, and then they balance the whole assembly together on a balancing machine. When you replace the bearing in this turbo, technically, yes, you should get the entire thing rebalanced. Any professional turbocharger rebuilder will tell you that. But there are known instances on DSM websites and that where people will actually mark 
the, on the nut uh, where they have the nut lined up, where they have the shaft lined up with the, the uh, turbine and the compressor wheel so that when they reassemble everything, it all goes back together in the exact position where it, they took it apart and all they're doing is replacing the actual oil uh, journal bearings that are inside the CHRA and technically you're not throwing anything out of balance. All you're doing is replacing the piece that was already there and if you have no side to side play or in and out play on the shaft itself, you shouldn't, in theory, need to get it rebalanced. Should you in actual real world practice? Yes. I'm not going to tell you to not get it rebalanced because that is just a, a big mistake to say. I'm not liable for you blowing up anything. So now let's tear into the actual center housing and see just exactly what went wrong on this turbo as to why there's oil spewing out both the turbine housing and the compressor housing. Okay, so tearing down the rest of this turbo is not gonna be any different than basically tearing apart any other Mitsubishi turbo. They're all relatively the same, uh, regardless of size, unless you're using a 14B turbo or something like that. Those, I think those are a little bit different. Okay, so on the compressor side, it looks like they also have another notched area right there. There's a pin that aligns with the CHRA on the compressor housing so that you can't clock them inappropriately. I guess they do that so that you don't have your oil drain and your oil feed mixed up because that would cause really bad problems with oil basically seeping out of every orifice possible on your turbo. Now, another big issue with any turbo really uh, if you're having blow-by is definitely going to be your PCV system. If you don't have the appropriate breather set up in place, you're going to have oil come out of everything. Uh, that could have been the case on the vehicle that this turbo was on. He may have just not had a proper catch can set up. Yeah, and there's a lot of oil on this center section. Not as much as there was on the turbine side, but I also cleaned it off with some non-chlorinated brake cleaner uh, just to make sure that I, I could see if there were any uh, chips in, the, in the, the blades or any scoring or marring on the insides of the housings. But so far everything's looking pretty good. It looks like it just blew an oil seal, which is not, not a huge, huge concern. Rebuilding these turbos is actually fairly simple. As you can see, there's really no shaft play side to side or in and out. So at least we know that the center section and uh, both wheels, uh, compressor and turbine, and the shaft itself that connects through the turbine wheel to the compressor wheel is all good. All we have to do is get the bearing kit. As long as it is the upgraded uh, performance 360 degree thrust uh, bearing. If you get the 270 degree one, that is not the appropriate bearing replacement for this center cartridge. Uh, talking to Barrett at Corksport, uh, well actually I was talking through one of the salespeople and they um, sent an email from either Barrett or somebody else from Corksport. Um, only use the 360 degree thrust bearing. Do not use the 270 because it is not appropriate for the performance of this application. Yeah, so there's definitely no no wear or scoring on the housing. There's a little bit of a mark right there, but it's not raised. Other than that, it's in the good, good shape. So now we're going to continue the teardown of the CHRA by taking off the compressor and the turbine wheel. Okay, so I had to use a bench vise to be able to get the nut off. So put it in a bench vise like this, the compressor wheel facing up. And you'll have to use the edge of a bench vise where it clamps right in between the CHRA. So basically like this. And I have a bench vise that um, the, the clamping parts are long, thin, rectangular pieces that fit right in between the casting of the CHRA where the compressor and turbine housings slide over and seal. So like that, a 10 mil wrench on this side and this uh, for the turbine 
I think it uses a triple square, but I have one of those weird ass um, husky wrenches, which it's basically a triple square, a 10 mil, and a whole bunch of stuff all in one. So I use that on this side, and it actually fit perfectly, and that allowed me to get the nut off. Gotta get that nut off. So now we can uh, try and pull our compressor wheel off. It's gonna be a little bit tight, or at least it should be tight. If it's loose, that actually might be more of a problem. So here you can see where they balance the wheel itself. There's a marking there, there's a marking there, and there's a marking there. Then there's a little bit of machining there as well. So this compressor wheel is designed very similar to what's called a Superback compressor wheel. So the Superback compressor wheel is what the Mitsubishi, I think it's the Evo 9 or the Evo 8, I can't remember to be honest. Um, but they use either a flat back or a super back. And this is the super back where it has a raised peak right in the center where it slides over the shaft bore. So this is a cork sport compressor wheel. I personally, they, they leave enough room on the very tip without thread that you can hammer on that. But again, with a brass or a rubber mallet to get your turbine shaft and wheel out. Yeah, you can see where the oil blew past and actually uh, hardened up. So it's not supposed to look like that. So this is your oil deflector, and that's one of your bearing collars. There you go. And this is your thrust bearing. So this is just a standard 360 degree performance thrust bearing. Usually the uh, Mitsubishi turbos only come with a 270 degree which means this bottom section right there is missing. So it's open there and you have this circumference there for your bearing to actually push against. And this is what everything rotates on. Now this piece is what we need to measure because if this is 14 mil, then that means that it is the standard size bearing replacement. So we'll grab our vernier. So this bearing collar is 14.6 mil, which is just a 14 mil bearing collar. So this is the standard collar replacement. So as long as you use a standard size uh, 360 degree thrust bearing performance rebuild kit, you can rebuild this turbo. You don't have to necessarily send it out And then this is your one bearing, and then this is your other journal bearing. And these are what it, um, the shaft spins on. And you want to always make sure that your shaft doesn't have any scoring or anything like that. That's what happens when uh, you have oil blow past your seals, and then the, the hot exhaust gas basically welds itself to the inside against the turbine wheel. So now that we have our measurements, uh, in the next part of this series, this is going to be a two-part video series, uh, I'm going to uh, show you putting it back together and going to get it balanced. Alright, so we have the turbo completely torn down. Getting the bearing kit for this should be very straightforward. As long as I get the appropriate 360 degree thrust bearing and not the 270 degree. That's literally all you need to rebuild one of these turbos and then get it balanced. It's that simple. Uh, you don't have to send it off to Corksport. I'm not saying that Corksport's a bad company or anything, just an, an idea to try and help you save some money for the same process. 
Uh, if you can source the parts yourself, that's awesome. If you have a local place that can balance your turbo for you, that's even better. It's not terribly expensive to get a turbo balanced. As long as you just give them the CHRA in good condition with both wheels already on, everything's torqued down, then they can balance everything for you. And it's, it's that simple. But I'm gonna try and do a little bit more research on that flapper arm, or at least the flapper itself. Uh, if I can actually fit a 34 mil flapper in there, that's great. Uh, it looks like it could be a little bit of a tight, tight fit. I don't know if when they redid the turbine housing itself, if they actually allowed for more room around the flapper and they actually changed the arm totally. Um, making it a little bit shorter so that you have more room for the flapper to go up and down. But that's all done, so that's it for this part in this series. It's gonna be a two-part series. In the next episode, uh, I'm going to be showing you how to put this back together with the new bearing kit, and we're gonna port that uh, wastegate port and then polish the inside of, well, I guess you can call it an O2 housing, kind of like what the uh, DSM guys call it port that housing uh, and polish it basically to try and see if we can make it flow as best as possible without needing to purchase a new housing. If in the end I find that I still have boost creep, then I'm, I have no choice but to buy a new turbine housing because something tells me I'm gonna have some issues with trying to put on a 34 mil flapper. If I can get a 32 mil flapper, great. but. I know that this is going to have some boost creep on its own if I do nothing. So I, I hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you own a Mazda Speed 3, Mazda Speed 6, or if you have, I don't know, a DSM or a Mitsubishi and you just enjoyed watching this teardown of a turbo because you're like me and you like turbo porn, consider subscribing. Uh, like this video if you actually did enjoy it. Let me know if I did something or said something totally wrong and I'm way off base. Let me know, correct me, because I don't want to be putting out false information. I do as much research as I possibly can first, but the, the brain's only so large. So, that being said, I will see you in part two of this series whenever that happens.